good evening, everybody. Um, I'm really honoured to be asked to talk to you all. I'm going to uh, read a short lecture and then open it out for questions and discussion. Um, this is about uh, Charles Scott Moncrief's impetus to translate Proust and the vivid influence that Proust had on his life. It seems the most controversial thing Charles Scott Moncrief ever did was to translate à la recherche du temps perdu as remembrance of things past and the controversy still resonates nearly a hundred years later. He came to this interpretation of the title very quickly when he first discovered Proust. In 1919, he returned from France, from the Western Front and from reporting the Paris Peace Conference. He disembarked on English soil a broken man. He was badly wounded in the right leg, walked with an iron caliper on his calf and a crutch. He was dispirited, because he knew that after the war, partly disabled men would be a drag on the work market and command a very low wage. The greatest reason for his low spirits was that he had rushed back to the front seven months previously to be in France at the same time as the man he loved, Wilfred Owen, and he was a hair's breadth from seeing him before Owen was killed. Back in London, he had great trouble finding lodgings and getting his mind back to accommodate peace. The world at peace was a very different place from the world at war, and he was still an angry man. There was anger in all his critical writing, and he made enemies of Siegfried Sassoon and Osbert Sitwell. The sniping went on in newspapers and periodicals for months, and the entire Sitwell family never forgave him. Then he came upon Proust, and immediately began translation. The detailed dissection of time and memory slowed him down helped him knit together his feelings and heal his mental wounds. Since 1981, In Search of Lost Time has obediently replaced <coughs> Remembrance of Things Past as the correct translation of Proust's title. But Charles, at that time, his adoption of the line from Shakespeare was something he would not budge on. When to the sessions of sweet silent thought I summon up Remembrance of Things Past, from Sonnet 30. And even when Proust wrote to him and said, à la recherche du temps perdu cannot possibly mean what you say, and he explained to Charles the intentional ambiguity in time lost and time wasted. Joseph Conrad, on the other hand, wrote, I was more interested and fascinated by your rendering than by Proust's creation. It has revealed to me something. What did it reveal and what did it mean to Charles? Remembering is the opposite of dismembering. What is scattered and chaotic and lost is brought together by another action. Dismember takes apart, remember remakes. There is a creative thrust, and it is not to make again, it is to make anew, which is why at the age of 40 we might suddenly say, oh, that's what my grandmother meant when she told me that as a child. It takes 30 years to remember it, for it to make sense. So there is a recreative act embedded in remembrance of things past. There is a putting together of the past in a meaningful way. Last year, I received a letter from a reader who works with war veterans, and he's given me permission to read his letter. I first read Remembrance of Things Past over a decade ago, and I read the volume slowly over two or three years. At some point before I finished the entire novel, I started working with wounded military service members at Walter Reed, which is an American military hospital. These soldiers and marines were coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan with serious injuries, including major limb amputations. It was then that I first learned that translator of Proust was an injured war veteran. Despite my research, I'm not interested in people because of their veteran status, but it has always struck me as meaningful that Scott McCreef would devote himself to Proust in the aftermath of what he ex had experienced and seen. While this may seem an obvious observation, Proust's novel has always been a touchstone for me in terms of reflecting on the self, the self and relationships, and those relationships in duration. Scott McCree's translation of the whole gives the work a powerful unity that the current Penguin translations do not have. On a more personal note, I've also been captivated by the way your great-great-uncle translated and enlivened Proust's descriptions of bodies, of clothes, works of art, and parties. His care suggests to me that in the aftermath of war, beauty, beauty and rendering commonplace things in a way that illuminates their beauty may have been an important project for him. 
My work involves observing and conducting lengthy interviews with young men and women who have experienced grievous injury. As a non-clinician, the only thing that I can give them back for their generosity of spirit and time is close attention. I've been doing this work for a bit more than a decade. While I do not consider the topic I study to be a sad one, it can at times be strenuous and exhausting. On those occasions, when I want to take leave from the realities of the post-injury lives, I read Proust, and about him and his world. And then he said, your extraordinary book has been a recent pleasure. Now, you can imagine what a pleasure it was for me to receive that letter. <coughs> but I think, for Charles, the healing properties of Proust were not something that was consciously appreciated. And what appealed to him primarily were the aesthetics, the philosophy, the universality of Proust's characterization and his humour and his satirical observation. Charles wrote to a friend early on to try and encourage the reading of Proust. And he said to her, I use it as a guide to word and action in myself and others, and I'm constantly explaining things to myself in terms of Proust. It was a way of interpreting people and society. And for Charles, there was another, greater, more mystical route to his translation of the title. He had become a Catholic during the First World War. This came upon him slowly while going through devastated France and was a result of his experience of the behaviour of the men in the trenches, the inspiration of the French cathedrals, and that writer that linked him since childhood with Proust, John Ruskin. Proust translated Ruskin, and Charles had Ruskin read to him as a child by his very literary mother. In 1915, Charles started attending Mass. During the Eucharistic prayer, it, the words of the Mass go, do this in remembrance of me, which meant for Charles a recreation of the Last Supper, an enactment that was at the same time a new thing, a completely new thing for that time and place, a recognition that that second was utterly new and valuable. The act of remembering was a present and a creative act, and when the remembrance came, it was a thing not in the present, it was a thing in the present, not a thing in the past. It is not like doing a jigsaw puzzle, slowly, logically, methodically, where you recreate an old photograph. It's much more instant and creative. And it gives you a jolt and a shiver down your spine, and you feel your life is knitting together. This continual moment of recreation was something he found reading Proust's novel. And I always think at the very beginning, when you, during the overture in Swan, uh, there's part of the the very beginning of recreation linked to the act of creation. So uh, Marcel is in bed and he says, sometimes too, just as Eve was created from a rib of Adam, so a woman would come into existence while I was sleeping, conceived from strain in the position of my limbs, formed by the appetite I was on the point of gratifying. She it was, I imagined, who offered me that gratification. And the reconstruction of Charles's life was done under the influence of Proust. But it started um, with an old coward, who was his <coughs> friend. They lived in the same street in London and were colleagues in their war of words against the Sitwells, whom Coward had satirised quite cruelly in the Swiss, as the Swiss family Pittlebot. Coward invited Charles to come with him to his friend Eva Cooper in her hunting lodge in Rutlandshire, north of London. They stayed at Hambledon Hall and Charles stayed on when Noel left, having made good friends with his hostess. She invited him back again and again. Charles would sit outside with Eva, and she would read Proust aloud in French. He would take notes and read it back again in English, like a good game of tennis. She said of him, what can be said in French cannot always be said in English without offence. And she continued about his translation using a hunting metaphor. He always took offences without hesitation. Charles dedicated the first part of Swan's Way to her with the following poem, which describes his healing process through beauty, friendship, and Swan. This is about his stay in Rutlandshire. Here, summer lingering loiter I, when I with summer should be gone, when only London lights the sky, I go, and with me journey Swan, whose pages, dull, laborious woof, covers a walk of working times, of firelit nights beneath your roof, and sunlit days beneath your limes. While both at once, or each in turn, sharp-tongued but smooth like buttered knives, 
we paired with studied unconcern the problems of our private lives. These tiny problems, dense yet clear, like ivory balls by Chinese craft, pierced where each hole absorbed a tear, and rounded where the assembly laughed. Did all our laughter muffle pain, our candour stimulate pretense? Fear not, I shall not come again to tease you with indifference. Yet I may gaze for oakum spire, when London suns set, watery pale, and dream where tides of crimson fire sweep smoking over Katmas Bell. This was written about two years after his stay there, so he was remembering um, his relationship with Eva, his friendship with Eva, his time in Rutland. It is actually on record that Charles has first encountered the pleasure of remembering at the age of five. His mother gave a party for the local gentry, and he was allowed to stay up and watch. The next day, he retold a joke he had heard at a party, complete with a description of the expression of faces. And when his mother remarked on the detail he remembered, he said, yes, it comes back into my mind like sugar. We all know what sugar means to a five-year-old. I have a six-year-old, and for him, there's nothing better. He would eat spoonfuls out of the bowl. Remembrance was like sugar already. In translating Proust, he used him to describe his life. To Edward Marsh, a London friend, he wrote an invitation to a lunch at the Reform Club, to which he also invited Noel Coward and Compton Mackenzie, saying it would be like Monsieur Gravy's parties at the Elysee. At the lunch, Noel Coward said that he'd named his cat Proust. <laughs> the discussion was around the impossibility of publishing a book in English entitled Sodom and Gomorrah. But Coward had a solution. Uh, the following year, in his play Easy Virtue, he wrote into the stage directions that the heroine should sit on stage reading a book entitled Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> But that was as close it got in Britain. That part of Proust's novel, retitled Cities of the Plain by Charles, was first published here in the States due to the intractability of Britain's obscenity laws. And I notice uh, now that if you download Sodom and Gomorrah into iBooks on your iPhone, then they categorise it as erotica. <laughs> while they categorise the rest of the volumes of the novel as literature. I mean, maybe somebody ought to uh, write to an apple like that. Um, while living in Italy later on in his life, um, Charles spent time in Stresa on Lago Maggiore, and at a lunch she met a French aristocrat who had known Proust, and who assured Charles that she was not the template for the Duchess de Germantes. <laughs> Ni Madame de Verdurin non plus, j'espère, replied Charles. I hope you're not Madame Verdurin either, he replied. <laughs> Meaning that he probably did think that she was like the expert social climber and poseur. <coughs> he was continually coming across Proust stereotypes in his own life, and that amused him greatly. He also noted in a letter to Edward Marsh that a certain member of the British government was on holiday in Genoa, and behaving like the Baron de Chavos. <laughs> it was in Rome, when he was working on Albertine Disparu, that he wrestled with the imaginary character and wrote to his publisher, I've only just managed to get Albertine out of the room. He was a little tired of, uh, tired of Albertine and her co coquettishness, which was a character trait he found in some Roman friends. He dedicated the sweet cheat gone, his version of Albertine de Sparou, to a man named Robert Curtius, who was a Proust scholar and a friend living in Rome. And he said to Charles, Charles generally received me with some strong abuse of Albertine, whose strong moods and vicious habits were at that time keeping him very busy. <coughs> the world of Proust was to him as familiar as the Via della Croce, and he roamed in it with the same enjoyment, though with a sarcastic want of respect. Rome became his final home. He loved the city and had friends among Romans and expat visitors. He lived in the Via della Croce, number 67, just off the Piazza di Spagna. If he climbed the Spanish steps and wandered to the right, he would come to the Via Gregoriana and the British Passport Office. Now, between the wars, the British Passport Office was the cover for all Secret Service activities. 
And Charles was involved throughout his seven years in Italy in helping with reporting and spying. And he dined nearly every night when he moved to Rome with his colleagues in the office. Lunch would often be had with friends at a restaurant called Daranios, where Charles would illustrate the conversation as it flowed with pen drawings on the marble tabletops. As one observer put it, he was always a congenial companion, a laughing philosopher, a satirical censor, a bubbling fountain of wit. It was good that Rome became home for him, because that was where he died. At the age of 40 of stomach cancer, in the Blue Nuns convent, an early hospice, his mother came to stay and nursed him on his deathbed, as she had in his childhood. And so his life came full circle, still chasing lost time. He still had not finished translating the final volume of Proust. And one of the Proust, one of the quotations of Proust that's most often used is very appropriate for his idea of remembering. The real voyage of discovering consists not in seeking new landscapes, but in having new eyes. And some of you may know that that's actually not a correct quotation. It's been, um, it's been shortened. And the full original quotation from La Prisonnière, which is, he translated as the captive, and was the second part of our LIT, is a pair of wings, a different respiratory system, which enabled us to travel through space, would in no way help us. For if we visited Mars or Venus while keeping the same senses, they would clothe everything we could see in the same aspect as the things of the <coughs> Earth. The only true voyage, the only bath in the fountain of youth, would be not to visit strange lands, but to possess other eyes, to see the universe through the eyes of another, of a hundred others, to see the hundred universes that each of them sees, that each of them is. And this we do with great artists. With artists like these, we do really fly from star to star. <coughs> both with his translation, because it was very, very hard, heavy work, and, and also with the character of Albertine, because um, he, she really annoyed Marcel, and so therefore she really annoyed him. And, <laughs> um, and I think that he, 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 was quite a, he was quite a lonely man a lot of the time, and he recreated the characters that he, from Proust's novel and brought them into his life, and he would, uh, he would um, bring them into his room and talk to them sometimes. Can you speak more about that, bringing in the characters to his room and speak to them? Was that kind of a therapeutic process for him, would you say? Well, maybe it was um, a therapeutic process. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't there, therapy. I can only imagine it. Um, I think that the most therapeutic process for him um, was the actual act of translating. And seeing the way uh, Proust dissected time and memory and analysed events and al analysed everything that one does in, in a tiny, minute way. And that was the most, uh, most therapeutic. Um. Um, what effect do you think um, his conversion to Catholicism had on his work as a translator of Proust. Well, Proust um, is, although Proust was, had a Jewish mother, yeah. he was brought up as Catholic, brought up by Jesuits, and so, uh, and, and his entire novel is imbued with slices of the history of French Catholicism. We even right at the very beginning, um, or, uh, when, when um, he's in bed at night and imagines his mother coming to kiss him goodnight, and he compares her face to the consecrated host. Um, but, but all the way through, you have all the rituals of Catholicism about his aunt, Léonie, 
watching people go to mass, and she can and she knows exactly when the point of elevation is coming because she can hear the bell. But his his Catholicism is always almost deeper than 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 Catholics, strangely. Proust <laughs> or, or Proust? Proust. So, um, if Proust, uh, but can, but um, Scott McGreef trans, um converted to Catholicism before he translated Proust. And so, therefore, I think it was probably much more meaningful for him because as a convert, he would have had to go through every single process in, in a very um, adult way and then examined every single process. And um, probably that also was part of the therapy, the fact that the translation of Proust was so full of Catholic references. <coughs> Can you say anything about uh, your process in researching this book? And well, this book took eight years, um, and um, it, uh, in, it, I really knew absolutely nothing about his life before I started. I knew that I was given a suitcase full of letters, um, which had been in my great aunt's attic and nobody else particularly wanted. Um, but my mother said, if you take that to a publisher, they'll, they'll want you to do something about it. And sure enough, I did. Chatter and Windows gave me an advance to start writing this book. Um, and all I had was family stories about him. I didn't, so I started off by seeing all the cross-references cross and everybody else's biographies, Secret Sassoon, Noel Coward, uh, G.K. Chesterton, a lot of the, all the great writers of the time seemed to have Scott and Creep as a footnote. Funnily enough, they all become footnotes in his biography now. <laughs> that, that was where it started. And then um, I, then it was just at the point where libraries were putting their research online. And so it was easier to find where his letters were. And an awful lot of them, most of them are actually here in the States. Um, there's a huge uh, bunch at the Bird, uh, in the Bird Collection here in the li New York Library. Those are his letters to Edward Marsh, who was a civil servant and patron of the entire Bloomsbury group. So all the letters to Edward Marsh, I also have masses from Virginia Woolf and the other members of the, of the Bloomsbury group are here in, in the Berg collection. But also he was unbelievably prolific. I mean, he wrote thousands of letters and his letters were like his diaries. So even when he was writing to his publisher, another stash of letters I came across were um, those to his publisher at Chateau and there were about 500 of those. He wrote those on a daily basis. He didn't just write to him about publishing, munitions and copyright. He wrote to him, he was unbosoming himself. He wrote to him about everything that was on his mind and everything that he was doing. There were no secrets, really, except there was one secret, one very big secret, which I didn't understand, I didn't uh, realize until the very end of the research. Well, there were two very big secrets. Um, <laughs> the first very big secret <coughs> was the fact that he was a spy. Um, and um, that I, I discovered that in the archives of Kew, um, and that was that also came through lots of various step, steps and stages. And finally, when I opened up his war archive, I realised that that's what he'd been doing as well as doing all his translating. Because of course, his tran the cover of a translation or under journalist was perfect for working in that sense. But then the other massive secret was his homosexuality. Well, I knew he was a homosexual, but I didn't know anything about the details of his love life at all. Right at the end, after I'd handed the book in to the publisher, um, uh, I found that in uh, Texas, uh, Austin, Texas, there were all his letters to Vivian Holland. Uh, Vivian Holland was Oscar Wilde's son, his eldest son. And he became a friend of Charles early on in his life, in about 1910. Um, and they had, a f they had an affair very brief affair. But then Vivian Holland, because he was Oscar Wilde's son, felt it incumbent upon himself to prove to the world that he was not gay. Mm -hmm. So he was uh, terrifically heterosexual. Um, <laughs> and, and he wrote about this to Charles all the time. And he asked Charles for advice. And Charles said to him he wasn't really qualified to give him advice. <laughs> but that um, he would try and wrote very witty replies. And then Vivian became the man to whom he confessed all his affairs, all his sexual affairs. And so these letters, which there were approaching 500 signs of letters, were a detailed a description of his sex life. And they were written in French, in Italian, in German, in Latin and in Greek in order to escape the censor. And they were quite extreme. Um, and um, I discovered them all. I said to the publisher, should I really put these into the book? 
And she said, well, if you don't, somebody else will. <laughs> and so uh, they are filleted into the book. So it, it, it's, it's, it's a kind of um, literary and spiritual journey which is sown with nuggets of quite extreme sex. So I, I, and actually, I think it puts a lot of people off. I, I know that there, uh, in Britain, quite a lot of people get to those bits and then don't read the rest of the book because they're offended by them. But um, probably it was because I hadn't been able to... Um, I, I, they'd all happened right at the end, and they had to put in, be put in quite fast. So is the book erotica on iTunes? <laughs> <laughs> during the translation. So I think he was obviously quite influenced by Proust when he was writing it. Yes, because it is a journey into his childhood through objects. <clears throat> Did the China doll and the other, uh, the China dog and the other story on Ant, which is the name of that, that little China yes. dog that yeah. gave the, the, the cook, I guess, Annie. Oh yes, yes. So, no, Ant is the name of the story about an aunt. Yes, that's that's called the aunt. Up, aunt. I'm not going to tell the end of the story. Yes. Excuse me, he had a surprise at the end. Yes. When she left him something in his, her will. Correct. <laughs> the house. Yes, that's right, yes. So this is a collection <coughs> of, of his, of his um, which is also here on, uh, on it. It's a collection of his short stories. So he was also a literary critic and a journalist and a poet, and he wrote a lot of short stories. And that is a collection of his poetry and short stories. Short stories are a bit like Saki. Um, yeah, and they also are very, very chronicle of that stage of, of um, deconstruction of society at the end of the First World War in Britain. Where, um, particularly one, the one about the, about the butler. Yeah. Where do I weigh in on the title, Chasing Lost Time? No. Well, that was very important to me. I didn't want to change that. In fact, my agent said, you must call it Proust's Doppelganger. Um, and um, I didn't want to call it Proust's Doppelganger, firstly, because that was someone else's coinage. That was from an article in the New York Review of Books, and I wouldn't like to take someone else's coinage who wrote about it and calling him there. Um, and also because doppelganger is a German word and it translated into French. And also, doppelganger is an evil alter ego, so I didn't really, you know, that's not what he is. Um, but chasing lost time is what all historians are doing. Uh, everybody who is writing at all, I think, is chasing lost time because it takes longer to write than it does to think. And so you're trying to catch the thoughts as they go. And also chasing lost time is an active translation of An recherche du temps perdu. So it's like hunting and uh, hunting, chasing words. Whereas in search is a bit more, it's a bit more sedentary. And remembrance is reconstructing. But, um, chasing is uh, it's alive and active. <laughs> I uh, I don't know if others in the room have had the same experience or would agree, but um, as you, as we all know, uh, there's a great deal of in the last few years controversy swirling around this and other translations of Proust um, and the claims and counterclaims and backing and forth. Those of us who much prefer the Scott Moncrief translation to anything that has happened since or any other, um, the, the weakest part of the debate that's gone on in print has been our inability to say very clearly and very effectively why it is we so much prefer the Scott Moncrief translation. Some attempts, there's one very good translator who teaches uh, some here at the center uh, who says it's the rhythm. He gets the rhythm right, the others don't. Uh, and with, with various explanations. But your book 
And I think even more, for me at least, your remarks tonight um, suggest perhaps a better answer than any of us have been able to come up with. And that is that it is so in tune with Proust because of a kind of shared humanity between Proust and Scott Moncrief. Uh, they share a certain humanity, a certain sensitivity, uh, certainly a love of, of robust humor. Um, it, it, it's two people, it seems to me, in tune with each other in such a human way. And uh, nobody can prove that, anything like that on a page, but it seems to me that that comes closer to hitting why we so prefer this translation than anything that has come out thus far in the debate going on. I don't know if others share that feeling. Yes, thank you. No, that's a very good one. Yes, because uh, Scott Moncrief was born at the same time. He'd experienced this very well, not, not long after Proust, and he'd experienced, although the world hadn't changed by the time Scott Moncrief was born, really, from the time when Proust was born. He, he experienced that fin de siècle decadence, and he, he, he knew all about the social hierarchies that were still completely in place in the Victorian, from the Victorian era still, when he was growing up, so he knew all about the snobberies in, in Proust, and he'd lived with that, and he was born in the same, into the same sort of middle-class household, and he was brought up by an incredibly literary mother, um, and he was a hugely literary child from very early on. She used to read to him from all the great writers. And, um, so, and, and he was a homosexual who had to hide it all the time at that time, completely, and, actually had, and it was hidden in this very clever way. Um, and Proust also went through the First World War, you know, although he was a bit older you know, than Scott and Creef. And they both experienced that shattering of the world at the same time. And I think he also did a bit like an extreme sport. He did extreme sport translation. So he, he, um, he did it really fast. It was all done by him. I mean, now, you know, it's taken seven people seven years to do the same thing. So what he did was extreme sport translation. And he, and he had been through an extreme in the First World War, so he knew what extremes were. And he just really pushed it through. Um, he was doing massive <coughs> other things at the same time as he was translating. He was translating Pirandello and Stondal and Abelard and Eloise. And, and then he had this phenomenal correspondence going on as well. So sometimes Proust was on the back burner, but I think actually it was what kept him going in his life. And he hadn't even finished it by the end of his life. It was really his um, life's work. Thank you for this. Yes. In your book, you describe one incident when Proust's brother, Robert, comes, I think, to the publisher. It seemed like he was unaware of the importance of Scott Moncrief's uh, translation and how it made, you know, his book accessible to English-speaking people. <coughs> I just sort of got that impression, maybe I was wrong. Well, he was very different, because Robert Bruce was like his father, a doctor, a medical doctor, and um, literature really wasn't his bag of tricks. And so he, he didn't even know about, you know, uh, about, he didn't, it, it, he was involved, because after Proust died, he collected together all his papers, and he and Gallimard set about um, sticking in all the missing pieces of paper the paper roll that were around the edge to try and make a much larger and a much larger book. And in the end they, they added another three hundred thousand words to what Proust had sent to the press. So uh, and then that had to be retranslated, so it kept the whole thing rolling. Um, so if you actually if you want to read what it was that Proust sent to the press. Of course, that is the Scott Moncrief translation. That's another thing about the beauty of the Scott Moncrief translation. It is it's what he sent to the publishers. Whereas the translations since then are what Gallimard and Robert Proust stuck together from the pieces of paper that were lying around in the room. <coughs> Which was obviously a good idea from a publishing point of view. Um, um, and the retranslating, of course, is a good idea from a publishing point of view. I mean, I fully support retranslations of Proust all the time because publishers have to be employed. <laughs> <laughs> I thought Kelly Mother was not the first publisher. No, he wasn't the first so. publisher, but he was the eventual publisher at the time when Robert Proust was putting it together. Oh. Uh, it was it was him and Robert Proust who re-edited it. 
Well, I don't know how much all the crews did. I assume there was many edit problems. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I said that you, um, before you began the book, that you weren't really aware of, you know, Moncrief's life. And I wonder what your relationship with Proust was before you uh, wrote the book. Well, and I also, when I think, um, your opinion on the various translations. Well, I studied, I studied French literature at university, and I wanted to do my final thesis on Proust. And then I went to an, an uncle, an old uncle, who had, had known Scott Moncrief. And he said to me, um, well, it killed Proust to write it, it killed C.K. to translate it, it might kill you to. That was the real reason I didn't do it. It was probably the length of it all. I did Balzac instead, and it was actually just a stage of it. But I, I think Proust is something that's better come to much later. I didn't read Proust until I was 40, and I probably couldn't have understood Proust until I was 40. I really couldn't have understood it when I was 20. So I'm glad I, I came to it at that point in my life. And you asked what I think of the other translations. Right. Well, I haven't read, I have to say, I have not read all the other translations. Um, because I, I instinctively <laughs> only want to read them. No, I've read, I've read some of Lydia Davis's translation. And um, I find it amazing that somebody whose own writing is so incredibly spare, I mean, she's the antithesis of Proust in her own writings. She writes the shortest short stories that exist. <laughs> and, and yet she's been, I mean, I think that was wonderful that she was asked to translate Proust. But there is the, I think, if you have not been imbued with that time, you can't, you, you, you can't, um, a modern translation is only going to be that. It's only going to be something for this time rather than something for that time. Um, Proust was off that time and so was Scott McCreef and therefore it's appropriate that that's, that that's what you read. Yes. Well, not a question, but uh, the, the, uh, the gentleman's uh, remarks about translation remind me of the, the greatest accolade that ever occurred given to this translation. And uh, I, I can't resist sharing it with everyone here. When I was a young man, I studied the Sorbonne, the, the courtesy of Réception Française, a part of the set up for foreigners. And uh, <clears throat> one of my professors was uh, uh, Monsieur Matafé, I think his first name was George, and he was interested in Proust, and he was interested in music. I think he wrote about uh, the role of music in Proust. And in class one day, he was talking about, so the subject of translations came up, and he says, well, the translation, of course, is always, you know, quite inferior to the original. He said, there are two exceptions to this rule. And the first is uh, um, the uh, translation of uh, Goethe's Faust by, I forget the name now, the uh, French poet uh, who translated. But it was such a great translation that Goethe on his deathbed, instead of reading, when he read Faust for the last time, mm -hmm. he didn't read it in German, he read it in the French translator, mm -hmm. the Girard de Nogal, I think, translator. And then he said the other, the other exception to this rule where the uh, translation was not inferior to the original was uh, C.K. Scott and Priest's uh, translation of La Recherche. Mm -hmm. Oh, That's so I think you know I mean, the French are so proud of their language. This yes. is a you know French professor who's interested in Proust. I think you know mm -hmm. that's that's a, it's quite a you know wonderful accolade uh, for your great great uncle's work. Well, I think it is. That's a great accolade. <laughs> I mean, Proust himself was trying. Well, he tried to translate Ruskin, but Ruskin is as difficult to translate, I think, as Proust is. And um, yeah. Uh, I'm working on something completely different. Uh, I'm actually writing a novel set in uh, Edinburgh and London between 1593 and 1628. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's not a biography or anything, it's actually a novel, but it is about a period of translation, about the greatest period of translation in the whole of the English language. So uh, James VI presided over, first of all, um, employing the very first playwright into the English court, who was Shakespeare, and second of all, uh, the translation of the Bible. Um, but this is about a Scottish king coming down to England and creating the Union. And I'm writing about it at this time because at this period, and right now, that Union is now coming apart. And so it's a really interesting time to be examining when it came together. And it was much more important, the Union of the Crowns was much more important than the Union of the Parliaments, I think, in, in the Union of Great Britain at that time. But um, 
James VI actually asked 54 translators to translate the Bible. Um, so that was a rather like the modern translation approach. <laughs> Is this a historical? I mean, it's an historical novel, yes. Yeah, it's an historical novel. There's a lot of there are fictional characters mixed in with it, but Shakespeare does come into it. And um, all the inspiration that Shakespeare took from James VI, because James VI was an amazing king. He was the most intellectual king that, that Britain ever had. He spoke many languages. And when he first came down to England, he spoke Middle Scots, which was very different from the English that was spoken at the time. So you had to learn the English of the court of England. And his wife spoke Danish and German. And she'd learned Middle Scots. So there were masses of languages <coughs> swirling around um, all at the same time anyway. Um, I think he's quite fast. Also, he was also gay. So, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of crossovers there. <laughs> <laughs> James I was going. James the sixth and first, yes. Well, that's what they say. Of course, there isn't any proof, but I mean, I think most historians now have come to the conclusion that he was gay, although he did have fruitful and uh, relationship with his wife. He produced seven children. So. He was occasionally gay. He was occasionally gay. <laughs> <laughs> Can you speak to Longreed's Catholicism and, and homosexuality? Did he compartmentalise his life so? Well, that was the one um, aspect of his life, I think, was, which was continually painful to him, yeah. I think. Um, and it was a sort of tug of war. Um, and he did... Um, he did go to mass a lot. He did go to con in those days. You couldn't attend mass without having first gone to confession. So, um, which meant that he also went to confession a lot. So, um, I imagine that it was he was just uh, falling in and out of. of uh, There'd be a fly in that wall. <laughs> yes, um, but he was a, a very a devoted Catholic. And um, that's why he went into the convent to die, and why he went somewhere where he could have mass every single day. Um, and I mean, I suppose his passion for his faith was um, uh, was great. Uh, hard to reconcile. Very hard to reconcile with his homosexuality, which actually I didn't realise, but continued right the way up until he went into hospital to die of cancer. So. Um, now, I thought when I first started this book that I could only anger two great institutions, the homosexual community and the Catholic Church, who are traditionally at loggerheads, that, that I couldn't possibly write something that would uh, be all right for both sides. But I am amazed to see that um, not only have an awful lot of priests read it and like it, but um, I was nominated for a Lando Award here last week. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it just shows the, the grace of forgiveness on both sides. <laughs> did, did he keep a journal as well? His, his letters and his, all his other things? Um, he did keep a journal during the First World War, um, which is all about, um, he writes, writes on the front of this journal, this is, said I don't, this is for all the half-remembered things. And they're just the details of training up his, his men for the war, the tiny little things like um, billy cans and cocoa and, and, and uh, the camaraderie of his, of his, of his men and um, tiny little details. And, and quite, uh, some of them were quite satirical as well about his commanders and people. Yeah, but a lot of that's in, in, the, in the book. But later on... So later on, he didn't need to keep a diary because um, his diary was his correspondence, and um, it was enormous. I mean, he just seemed to be able to write thousands and thousands of words per day, not only in translation, but also in his correspondent pages and pages to different people every single day. It just got faster and faster and faster. It was just burnt out completely. And he kind of lived, in the end, he lived off a black coffee and wine. I don't think he ate much food in the end. Didn't have time. No. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what he'd do with the emails. <laughs> 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 delete, delete, delete. <laughs> yes? Um, I wanted to ask about the spying. How did that start? How did the spying start? Yes. Well, 
Um, when he was wounded and came out uh, during the First World War in 1917, when the war wasn't finished, um, he didn't want to stop working um, for the war effort. And he had friends who were in the war office, which um, was the intelligence section, and it was actually MI-17 was the intelligence section at that time, because there were so many sections in the war office, it was the biggest it had ever been. Um, and he um, worked uh, when he was just in, from 1917 onwards in the war office in London, and it was at that point that he was recruited by the spy master at the time. And it was that point that they put together the idea for British passport officers being the cover for spying activities all over Europe. Um, they thought that you know under this mundane action of stamping passports, they could get away with, with being spies. So they were. There were quite a lot of staff in these passport offices. And then um, he stopped that when he came back from the war and started doing his translating. But um, in 1926, um, his cousin, who had continued in um, the Secret Service right the way through the war, his cousin was called Louis Christie, um, invited him to stay with him. And after that meeting, he told him that he was going to be in Rome and he was uh, the king's messenger in Rome. And um, if, if Charles came out, then he he could help him. So um, he moved out to Italy in 1923 when he was 26. No, 1920. Sorry, this is in 23. He moved out in 1923. And um, uh, his whole seven years in Italy, he was translating and he was also writing reports for Louis, who was the head of the British passport office in Rome. So that, that was why he moved up and down the coast of Italy. He'd be two weeks in Pisa, two weeks in Via Reggio two weeks in La Spezia, two weeks in Genoa. And um, he, this, uh, at that point, during the interwar period, although Mussolini had been supposedly friends with Britain during the, during the last war, um, Mussolini now thought that uh, the part of the Middle East that Britain owned ought to be Italy's. And so he was sending out um, ships with munitions and uh, engineers and spies out to Yemen and to the islands in the Red Sea um, all the time. And he, he, stuck, he, he was quite open about it. He went, he sent ambassadors to Whitehall and they said to the British, look, uh, that area of the globe is traditionally Italy's. Um, it used to be part of the Roman Empire and we want it back. And the British said, no, you can't have it back. And then they'd go away for two weeks and come back with the same Request. And it's interesting because if you look at um, uh, the notes, Hansard notes for Whitehall at that time, it's the Italians going in and out asking for parts of the Middle East and Britain saying, no, you can't have them. And so um, obviously they thought that Italy would try and just take them. And that's why they needed spies down there at that time. And he would hang around ports and find out which ships were going out and what was on them. Um, and they were sending. Uh, sending munitions out to the Yemen. Um, also, he was friends with a lot of pilots um, who uh, were flying over and mapping that part of Middle East. So it was just small things that he was doing um, and reporting back to his cousin, who was the head of operations in, in Rome. Well, Noel Coward was also a spy at that time, wasn't he? Um, Noel Coward, no. Are you thinking of Graham Green? No, I don't think Noel Coward is a spy. Well, he did some spying, yeah. Well, he said it in his biography. Oh, did he? All oh, right, well, maybe. Mm -hmm. Graham Green, right. too. Um, maybe, well, I know he went out, he was always entertaining troops, wasn't he? Maybe he did some spying, too. Mm -hmm. What I found fascinating about, because um, I had to read the whole of the history of MI6, which has just been produced by um, an academic at the Belfast University, um, and was that uh, the MI6 worked, so it, it had sort of a, a, a band of about 10 branches, and they'd all be given um, different jobs to do, and none of them would know what the next one was doing. So um, it was all um, a, a lot of hit and miss, and, and um, yes, probably, possibly, if Carol was spying, he wouldn't know that so Scott and Griff was spying either. <laughs> But Compton Kenzie, who was his friend as well, and he was a novelist, he uh, admitted that he was a spy. He wrote this book called Water on the Brain, which was about the Secret Service. 
And it starts off by saying, secret service, the, the, the thing about secret service is that it is secret. And then he went on to spill the beans about the British passport office. And this was in 1934, before, um, and so he was prosecuted under the, civil service, the Official Secrets Act um, for writing this novel, half of which was completely disguised, but he was, and he was fined, and he had to pay the fine. This was very shortly after Scotland Creek died. And before Scotland Creek died, he'd written to him asking him about Water on the Brain and whether it was all right to publish it. But, and Scotland Creek thought, yes, it would be fine. And it wasn't. Um, how did this book affect your family life? Well, um, my children uh, have been incredibly <coughs> patient. Incredibly patient. Uh, I've got three boys. Um, and um, in the middle of it, I had another baby, which uh, made the whole thing a bit longer. <laughs> um, and it's been very good for my family life, I think, really. I mean, uh, the thing about uh, uh, writing a book is that it keeps you at home. If you've got children, it's a very good thing. And the, great, the larger family, the relatives of the group? Well, the relatives, yes, that was that was a bit because I have some relatives um, who are very, um, very strict Catholics, and uh, I was quite uh, afraid of them reading it in the end. And the most strict of all, my uncle Michael, um, read it, and then he said to me, "I want to talk to you about this." <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, was, uh, I went to see him, and he said, "He said, this is the first time I have ever understood." what a homosexual man has to go through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it was. <laughs> Although, um, I don't think my mother is quite so forgiving. I don't think she likes all the rude bits of it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think that's... Um, Thank you very much.